Hey everyone, are you ready to get out of the house and serve our community? We have an exciting and unique opportunity for you. On October 31st, we're inviting you and your small group to come serve at First Fruits Farm in Parkton for some fellowship while we harvest. If you want to sign up, just let your small group leader know. We hope to see you there. One of the meetings we have here as a staff is our WINS meeting. We do it every Monday at 1 o'clock. And I'm not really a big, huge fan of meetings, to be honest. But I actually, I, I like our Monday WINS meeting. I think it's one of the most important meetings of the week. Uh, it's only about a 15-minute meeting. I mean, that's why I like it. But uh, along with that, though, I think it's really important because what we do at our WINS meeting as a staff is we, we share our wins. We just say, here are the good things that have happened over the past week that uh, have been successes, that we've seen God move, where we've seen stories of impact and life change and people coming in a relationship with God or moving forward in a relationship with God. And that's what we do at our, our Monday Wins meeting. And one of my favorite parts in the Monday Wins meetings or favorite moments in the Wins meeting is when somebody thanks somebody from a different department. So maybe our, our student ministry thanks our operations or our small groups thank someone in our, our missions, or, or you see different departments come together and accomplish something that they couldn't possibly have accomplished on their own. And, and I love just seeing successes happen in our church that I had nothing to do with, that other people did, and it just reminds me that I'm part of a team, and I'm part of something much bigger than my own efforts and energy. Teamwork, unity, it's so powerful, isn't it? I mean, we see it in sports. Right? I mean, th think about professional sports. I mean, all these, 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 these athletes, they are incredible athletes. They're exceptional athletes. What separates you know, the, the mediocre or poor organizations from the excellent ones? I don't think it's just talent. Because, they're, again, they're all excellent. They're all amazing athletes. The difference is that certain organizations, sports organizations, seem to be able to unite. And they, they bring the whole organization together. Not just the players, but the whole uh, the, whole, the whole organization. We see it in nature, the power of teamwork and unity. Take geese. Okay, I know you think about geese a lot, but one, how much further can a, a geese flying in V formation fly than a single further? Can it fly than a single goose? 70% further. 70% further. Or look at Belgian workhorses. I know you think about them all the time too, I'm sure. But uh, they look at, they study Belgian workhorses, these, these animals that are meant to move, you know, thousands of pounds of weight. A single Belgian workhorse can, can pull about 8,000 pounds. You put two Belgian workhorses together that have never worked together, can they pull double the weight? No. They can pull three times the amount. So while one Belgian workhorse can pull 8,000 pounds, two working together that have never been together can pull 24,000 pounds. You put two horses that work together for a long period of time and get to know each other and know each other's strengths and weaknesses, so to speak, they can pull four times the amount of weight. There's power and impact in unity. And of course, our Savior knew this. Jesus knew the power of unity. So at the Last Supper, he prays for unity. You know, all four Gospels tell us about the Last Supper, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But John's Gospel delves very deep into the Last Supper. It's, he actually spends five chapters of his Gospel talking about the Last Supper and what Jesus says to the apostles in those last few moments with them. And he, he tells them a lot of things. And then he prays this one prayer. He prays, Father, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So Jesus says the Father had sent him into the world to redeem and save the world. And now Jesus sends the apostles and all his followers into the world. And now look at what he prays here. He says this, I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, that they may be all one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they may also be in us, so the world may believe that you have sent me. So Jesus says he prays not only for the apostles and that first generation of followers, but that all of us that believe through their word. Right? We believe in Jesus because the apostles and those first generations of Christians, they shared 
their relationship with Jesus Christ. They share their personal experience with Jesus Christ with others. And every generation has taken up that mantle. So now here we are 2,000 years later, and we believe because others have passed on that experience with Jesus. So we all believe because generations have passed down their faith and their experience with Jesus Christ. And then also look at what Jesus says here. He says this, that the world may believe that you have sent me. So Jesus says about, he prays for unity, he prays for oneness for all his followers, for every generation. And look at what he says. He says that they may believe you have sent me. That as we unify as a church, we make it easier for people to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came into this world. Then Jesus continues. He says this, The glory which you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. So look at in those two verses, in 22 and 23 from chapter 17, Jesus three times says, make them one. And he says, make them perfectly one. In other words, we, we want to close the gap. That there's no division whatsoever between us. That we are perfectly one because as we are perfectly one, the world will come to know that Jesus was sent into the world to save and redeem the world. And, the, and there is, unity is powerful. It leads to glory or success or victory, as Jesus says there. There's glory. And we, we see that in sports teams. Again, a team comes together. They work for this common purpose. And in the end, when they win the championship, what is there? We see that glory, right? We see the fruits of their success. Unity is powerful. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus united a diverse group of people, people who held all kinds of different political views. He, he, he united Gentile and Jew. He united poor and rich. He united them all together in the belief, that, to, to, in the belief and the truth that God had sent his son into the world. And believing in Jesus, they changed and transform the world for good. I love what Acts 17 says about the early church. They turned the world upside down. And so, in this season, that is incredibly divisive in our country and even in our world. Divisive because of our, the politics going on and divisive because different views of the COVID crisis and just there's just division and tension and all that. It's so important that we become united so that the world may believe Jesus is the Son of God, that God sent His Son into the world. So that's what we're going to do with the course of the series. And we're going to look at the things that do unite us, that of course we are united in, fo in following Jesus. We have a common mission and purpose. We're going to look at that. That we are united in a common vision. That we are united in a common strategy to bring God's love to the world that we were united in sharing our resources, our resources of influence and our financial resources and of energy and talent, that through the course of this series, we're going to remind of how we are united to serve a God that's going to last out, that, that, that is eternal, to serve God's church, which is 2,000 years old and has outlasted every single organization, every other single nation, and will continue to go on until the end of the time because Jesus promised to build his church and then nothing will prevail against it. So it just makes sense for us to unite as a church. So we're going to look at that through the course of the series. So what I want to encourage you for this week is to do two things. Number one is to pray. Pray for the union of the church. Pray that we would be one as Jesus prayed. And second is to fight for unity in, your, in this church. And the most specific way you can do that is to fight for unity in your own small group. Right? Your, your group is, is so important that there is unity there. And don't let allow political discussions or arguments or things like that to get in the way of why you're together. Because at the end of the day, we're together to grow as followers of Jesus Christ and to help one another for that purpose. And 
again, our political views are valid and it's certainly we're open to having them and it's okay to have them and have differences of opinion, but let's not forget our purpose is to help one another grow closer to Jesus Christ, to make each other better men and better women because we're helping each other grow, grow closer to Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray for unity in our church, that may we be one as you are, uh, are one with your Son and make our small groups unified. Keep them together. Help them be, to share this common purpose, the common vision of coming together to grow closer to you. Pray for unity, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.